voices, we often look at the lives of those living with challenges and what they do to overcome them. Today we learn from those often referred to as the disabled and their communities. These are individuals living their lives despite the challenges they face every day. They're also often the source of inspiration to those like them and many others in their communities and beyond. We'll share their stories and take a look at the effects of some legislations that could translate into a life or death sentence for many of them. Welcome to the conversation. I am Orion Itangishaka and this is Our Voices. Let's begin our conversation in Nigeria where an aid group is helping hundreds of women living with disabilities become their own bosses by learning how to make crafts and sell them. The group recently held a trade fair to showcase the product as Timothy Obwezu reports from Abuja. Rabi Mustafa has mastered the art of soap making. Stirring and pouring the liquid soap into bottles, she brands them and prepares them for distribution. Mustafa earns a weekly income from her business, but as a physically disabled woman, life has been tough. Despite the stigma, Mustafa managed to get an education. And now, making liquid soap helps her pay for her children's schooling. Anytime I want money, Once I take out some money to buy chemicals for my soaps, then I use the rest to pay for my children's school fees. An estimated 30 million people in Nigeria are living with disabilities, they are among the country's poorest because of the stigma and marginalization they suffer. Advocates say women and girls face even more difficulties than their male counterparts. The Nigerian non-profit Disability Rights Advocacy Center, or DRAC, is trying to address that problem by teaching disabled women craft making, including sewing, soap and bead making, and catering. The non-profit recently hosted a trade fair for disabled women to display their products to more customers. Irene Patrick Ogbogu is the founder of the non-profit. Because of the stigma that is associated with disability, most times people do not patronize them. And so we looked at all of this and felt, okay, how about also um, helping them break that barrier of patronage? And that's why we came up with this idea of having a, we call it the Abuja Inclusion Fair. We will do more as the funds are made available so that person with disability in Nigeria can have a sense of belonging. And then they shift from the old narratives. As for Mustafa, she will continue making her soaps, hoping for the next big opportunity. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Now, in Burundi, an NGO, Disara, understands that stigma is something that exists because of the lack of information many have about the life of a person living with a physical challenge. In their work's core mission, they highlight the personal stories of those living with disabilities in order to give them a voice in society, while also giving them a place they can call home in the northern province of Chibitoke. Fidel Musiri, founder and executive director, tells us more about Disara. The reason why I've, I give a, a voice to my people you know, who are living in disability country is to combat the discrimination against people with disability in the country. The children right now still locked up in their houses during a day when their parents went out from their homes. And children with the disability don't have access to mobility aid. I mean, wheelchair, crutches, mm, recycle, cans, walks, walking stick, et cetera, et cetera. And children with a physical disability enrolled at the primary school, they are supposed to be equipped and supported. And uh, adults with a physical disability, they were also supposed mm, to be supported and equip equipped as most of them, they didn't get a chance to finish primary school, secondary school, university. Those have been got a chance to finish university and the secondary school. They don't have opportunity to have a nice post, which is very sad to hear. 
So in the YouTube channel, you allow them to tell their stories. We've seen, we've seen many stories of their daily lives, and this is where they come to tell their stories the way they're living. Yes, we're allowed. And normally people understand, and they have already started to answer positively yeah, to the people with disabilities in the country because yeah, we have seen that there are some people whom their lives have already changed. There was one of them who was toilet digger. And when the Musiri Champion TV came to visit him, he, the Musiri Champion TV advocated for him. And then now he left that job. Now he started a new life. He has a shop where he can live and support his family. The second was a child who missed the money to go to the hospital. But when the Musiri Champion TV advocated for the child, now the chart was supported by people from outside of the country in the Europe country. They gave him money and the mother of the child brought the child to the, to the hospital and now the child is good, not, not any problem. And could you tell us a little bit about some of the activities that you have in your center in Chibitoke? What are some of the activities that they are able to take advantage of? We have 50 children a day, every day from Monday after Friday, from 9 a.m. to up to 5 p.m. Parents br bring them from their homes and after five, they come back to pick them up from the center to the homes. But the, our plan is to change the institution to become a boarding institution where the children may live forever and get assisted every day. Mm -hmm. That is the first one. The second one is a sewing program for the women. Mm -hmm. We have 34 women, and they are now trained after six months. They're going to be equipped and they start a new life through cooperatives. Mm -hmm. And the other one is uh, carpentry for the male with uh, other disability. Mm -hmm. Yes, we try to train them about the carpentry. Mm -hmm. And after six months again, they're going to equip them and put them in a cooperative so that they can become independent in the future. It's time for a quick break. When we return, we'll look at legislation in some parts of the continent and how they affect the lives of those living with disabilities. We'll go to two countries. First, Nigeria, where we look at the lack of cancer skin care treatment for the albinos. And then South Africa, where many blind people have been denied education because books are not being translated into Braille. That's coming up next. Stay with us empowerment and humanity towards a better world. Economic and social progress of every society. Facts and information from key players rather than spectators in politics, business, science and technology. City, rural, educated, all underprivileged. We care and we listen to what matters to you. Your voices are our voices. Welcome back, you're watching Our Voices. Today we're discussing the challenges and success stories of those living with a physical challenge or disability. Now, the Albinism Association of Nigeria, AAN, is petitioning the government to resume free cancer treatment for albinos. The free treatment was stopped years ago because of a lack of funding. Timothy Obwezu reports from Nigeria. This rash on Cynthia Okachi's skin can be deadly. I have two or three on my neck. Yes, three on my neck. I have two at my back. And I just have this on my forehead here. It looks very, it looks um, very small, but it's very painful and it can bleed. Ukachi says sores are malignant skin cells capable of spreading and causing skin cancer that could be fatal. Ukachi says she first noticed the changes on her skin in 2018. She received treatment thanks to a government program that offered free skin cancer care for albinos. But now, she says her condition has returned and the government has ended its free treatment plan. So noticing this issue again, uh, I already know what it is, but I couldn't go back to the hospital knowing I'll be asked to pay. And the money is what I do not have. If the government wants me to leave, if the government wants persons with albinism to leave, they should reinstate 
the free cancer treatment. Authorities started the program in 2007 and the Albinism Association of Nigeria says more than 5,000 patients, including Ukachi, benefited from it before it was discontinued. Jackie Epele is a skin cancer survivor and the group's president. Even the current administration started skeletal implementation at the beginning of their uh, uh, tenure, but then reneged. Um, and the reason is simply that uh, poverty, poverty of funds and, and the fact that they cannot continue to offer this treatment. And of course, the effect is that uh, persons with albinism are dying in droves. Medical experts say albinos are a thousand times more likely than the general population to develop skin cancer due to the partial or complete absence of melanin, a pigment responsible for eye, hair and skin color. In Nigeria, myths and discrimination associated with albinism make it far more difficult for those with the disorder to get jobs and afford skin cancer treatment. In May, the Albinism Association renewed its call for the government to reinstate the free skin cancer treatment. Nigerian authorities responded. With the permanent secretary. We had discussion with the permanent secretary of the Federal Ministry for Health for us to be able to revisit this. We're going to provide some funding support to do that. Additionally, by next year, we're going to provide proper budgetary allocation that will support this cancer treatment for our people. The Albinism Association cautions there is no time to lose as free treatment is the only lifeline for persons around the country like Okachi, who fears she will run out of time. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Blind South Africans took to the Constitutional Court to challenge an apartheid-era law that prevents books from being easily printed in Braille, the written language for the blind. Critics say that the law has made thousands of books inaccessible to blind people, affecting their education and job prospects. Zahara Kasim reports from Johannesburg, South Africa. <laughs> In the book famine for the blind. That's the message these South Africans want to convey to the country's highest court. Two non-profits, Blind SA and Section 27, are in the Constitutional Court to challenge a 44-year-old copyright law that blocks the conversion of books into Braille, a system of touch reading for the blind without the permission of the publishers. Currently, less than 0.5% of published works are available in accessible formats to the blind in South Africa. For the last 44 years, blind people's rights have been violated. And in Demo democratic South Africa, for 28 years, we are being stifled. For how much longer can this continue? The injustices must stop, and it has to stop now. Blind activist Tandile Butana has had her struggles with this law. She has completed a university degree in social sciences but has delayed her master's degree because of the difficulty of getting textbooks translated into Braille. Unfortunately, we cannot contribute positively to the economy of the country if we are not educated. And education depends on the accessibility of books. During her undergraduate studies, she would have to pay other students to read the textbooks out to her. Now, the same copyright law is affecting her ability to help her son with his homework. Me not having books that are accessible for my needs, it makes me a less of a mom. I can't help him on my own. Her struggle is not isolated to South Africa's blind community. It's a problem for most visually impaired people in Africa. The World Blind Union, the WBU, estimates blind people on the continent only have access to 1 and 7% of books. The Marrakesh Treaty, which allows for the exchange of accessible format books across international borders, has been signed by a number of African nations. Jackson Agufana, chief executive of Kenya Union of the Blind, says a positive ruling in South Africa could have implications across the continent and put pressure on other countries to join the Marrakesh Treaty. And I think it will accelerate the pace of 
other countries, especially countries in the Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Central, West Africa, and put pressure on governments to ensure that majority of them who have not ratified the treaty are able to do so. And those who have ratified and domesticated are able to accelerate the pace of implementation of the treaty so that majority of visually impaired people can access books. South Africa's constitutional court has yet to issue its ruling on the copyright law. No one is sure when a decision will be handed down, but South Africa's blind community is hopeful the ruling will be a positive one and open up a new world of content for the visually impaired. Sihir Kasim for VOA News, Johannesburg, South Africa. To better understand some of the current disability laws on the continent, my co-host and I had the opportunity to talk with Katia Sakala, Regional Head of Programs of Disability Rights Advocacy Fund, a fund with a unique participatory model of grant making that incorporates the participation of people with disability in the decision making. We begin asking her the evolution of disability rights in Africa. So the evolution started way back 1981 with the adoption of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. But the way in which these rights were framed in this charter, or in this African Charter, it was in a more charitable um, approach, which was looking at um, persons with disabilities as um, objects of charity and mercy and not really rights holders. So from that aspect, we came up, uh, there was now a time when uh, um, specific uh, ch charters protocols were, were adopted. For example, the protocol, the charter on the rights and welfare of the child, which also contains uh, provisions on the protection of the child with a disability. Then we also have the protocol on the rights of women. So we have had a number of charters, protocols, legislation at the national level and at the regional levels. But it is only when the, with the introduction of uh, the, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that we saw a lot of African countries ratifying and signing up to this uh, convention. That when we saw a shift from the charity and uh, medical model of viewing disability to the rights-based perspective. And it was from this that um, the realization came about that there should be a, a regional specific protocol yeah, uh, so I'm going to take you to the issue of education. I was reading this quote from a study that um, there are as many as 32.5 million children with disabilities in low and middle income countries that are out of school. And I think it's a very big number. So my question is one, what are the, the barriers that keep children with disabilities out of school? And two, uh, what can be done to encourage inclusive uh, education. That means promoting uh, disability inclusion in regular schools so that they can benefit from the diversity. Yes, that is very, very important because uh, you find that they uh, are compared to the other children that are not disabled. Children with disabilities are most of the time not included in school. We do have a lot of countries that have come up with policies and legislation that is talking about inclusive education. But uh, when it comes to the practicality on the ground, most of these schools do not have the infrastructure that can accommodate uh, these children. So starting from the physical infrastructure and also looking at also the teachers are not well equipped to handle various uh, uh, impairments that these children may have. Starting from the family level, if the family does not see the value of education in the child who is disabled, they're looking only at the barriers and looking at the limitation that this child has, it means that this parent will not see the importance of taking their children to school, but the biggest barrier is about physical infrastructure. Sign language interpretation is one of them, but uh, it, it can also be as easy as somebody just uh, uh, having maybe uh, assistive technologies, maybe like Braille, maybe like um, adaptable computers so that somebody who's blind, a child who's blind can learn by listening using a computer that is adaptable. You know, all this is, um, you know, you hear about the challenges that people with disabilities face, especially young children. Um, and you mentioned uh, uh, such terms as abducting laws and ratifying laws. But most of the challenge, I think, what I've heard 
people refer to is the implementation of these laws to protect these mm -hmm. children, to protect people with disabilities. How do you ensure that that happens now that they are applied? Most countries in Africa are very quick to um, adopting these laws, ratifying the laws. But when it comes to the actual implementation, that is actually a very big challenge. One, because they say that uh, before uh, um, a law can now become into, it can, can be applied into the domestic law, it needs to be domesticated. But that means that there is not only one law, it could be education, employment, uh, social policy. So there are so many laws that need to be revised. So there is, it's a step by step. And it is also now upon the civil society organizations to push for these governments to ratify, to domesticate into their local national policies. So the delay is maybe because they do not have funds or they do not have the technical capacity to review the laws. They do not have the people that the political will is actually sometimes not there. Uh, the ADP is a binding uh, treaty, which, you know, as we understand it, 15 countries, if they have the political will to sign upon it, the whole continent will have to abide by it. What is the status on that right now? And do you think these countries will be motivated to back it up with political will as well as resources? And um, that is yet to be seen because this is now um, over two years since it was adopted. I think it was adopted in 2018, but up to now, there has been uh, the, the, the continent has not yet achieved the 15 required signatures. Out of the 54 countries in the in the continent, only so far is when you look at the website, it's only three countries that are showing to have um, ratified the convention so far. 15 have signed up, but not yet ratified. But there are other countries that have already ratified and deposited the signatures, but those have not yet been um, shown as having deposited at the African Union. So it was also upon the African Union to quicken up the process of um, Posting these signatures, yes, so that um, more can be achieved through the African disability protocol because it promises a lot for the continent in terms of disability rights. It's time for another break, but before you go, what should governments do as a priority for people with disabilities on the continent? Please share your thoughts on this topic on our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our handle is at VOA Our Voices. We are also on WhatsApp. Our number is right there on your screen. When we come back, we'll share with you a story of Ruth Shigra, a fashion designer who was featured in Malawi's first fashion show for people with disabilities. That's coming up next. Welcome back, you're watching Our Voices. Now we give you a front row seat to Malawi's first fashion show for people with disabilities. In our Uncommon Voices segment, disabled fashion designer have long struggled against discrimination, especially in developing countries. To combat the problem, Malawi fashion brand has of Zandria organized the country's first fashion show for people with disabilities. Lamek Masina reports from Blantyre. Twenty-one-year-old Ruth Chirwa went into fashion and design industry four years ago after her dream to become a pilot failed. Because at that time, I miss because at that time I had no school fees for a piloting course. What the well-wisher could manage at that time was to pay me for a fashion and design course. I had no option, and when I started, it was not that easy for me. Chirwa, who now owns the fashion brand. Upis Designs in Nzuzu, a city in North Malawi, says discrimination has kept her from gaining more customers and promoting her designs. People look down on me. They think I cannot make nice outfits. They think because I am disabled, I cannot manage what they want. So it has really affected me. And as a result, this has affected exposure of my products. She recalls an incident when a potential customer who was attracted to an outfit worn by her friend, refrained from buying 
after noticing that Chirwa, who made the outfit, was disabled. So by the time they just came. So when she entered my shop and saw me, she was seemingly very disappointed and did not expect that I was the one who made the outfits. She was disappointed with my physical appearance and returned without pressing any order. Though disappointed, Chirwa did not give up. She was among 60 participants at Malau's first fashion show for people with disabilities, which the House of Zandria, a Malawian fashion brand, organized in Blanta. Organizers said the All Shades of Beautiful show was aimed to address some of the challenges people with disabilities in Malawi face in exposing their talents and creativity. So I thought, okay, let me create a platform and give these people a chance to show people that being having a disability is not having an inability, but they're also able to do amazing things, even more than what other people can do as well. And the plans are being made to help them sell their outfits without fear of discrimination. And in the long run, we want to create a hub where all these people can bring their things to that hub and people can come through and see and buy. And we already have a market, so we are creating that market for them so they don't have to go through the struggle of finding customers, advertising, we'll do all that for them. People with disabilities make up 11% of the Malawi population according to the country's 2018 census but many of them are ultra poor largely because of discrimination in employment. Many complain they cannot get help from money lending institutions because of their appearance. The Malawi government says it is working to address that. We have the cash transfer program which we also focus very much on the chiefs to make sure that when they are retargeting they've got not to leave persons with a disability because sometimes at a, chief, at a village level they let them down without even retargeting them. Gariati said the government has also asked money lending institutions to prioritize entrepreneurs with disabilities like Chirwa and to promote their businesses. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Blanta, Malawi. And that's our show for this week. Special thanks to our guests Katia Sakala and Fidel Musiri for being on the show this week. On behalf of my co-host and the Voice of America, I am Oriani Tangishaka. Thanks for watching. Good day.